Good morning. Welcome to Worship at Bethlehem. This morning we are finishing up our series called Focused, and today we're focusing especially on faith. So on the, having an attitude that says, God's promises are bigger than my biggest fears. So that'll be the theme of our readings and our sermon today. We'll follow the order of service printed for you in the service folders that will also be up on the screens. And we'll begin this morning with our opening hymn. May God bless our worship together this morning. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we confess our sins and receive God's forgiveness. Please stand. If your transgressions are forgiven and your sins are covered, you have a good life. Knowing where forgiveness comes from, let's confess our sins to the Lord. I have acted like a lost sheep. I have gone my own way and not yours. I have gone after what I wanted and you hated. I have offended you. I have sinned against your law. I have done what I should not have done. 
I haven't done what I should have done. Have mercy on me, Lord. Forgive me, restore me. You promised, Lord. God has promised to forgive all your sins. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save you. Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience to his Father as your substitute. Jesus paid the debt you owe to God by dying on the cross. Jesus freed you from death by his resurrection. You have peace with God right now and forever. Let's pray to the Lord with the peace of forgiveness in our hearts and on our minds. Let's pray to the Lord that we would live in peace with him. Let's pray to the Lord that all people would find peace with Jesus, that Christ's church would flourish, and that we would be united. Let's pray to the Lord for each of us who are here today to worship and praise him. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. You can be seated. Now God comes to us in his word. We'll begin with the opening responses. The Lord be with you. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray. Pour out your mercy on us. Forgive us the sins that torment our consciences. This morning, all three of our readings have to do with faith and contrasting faith with fear or faith with worry. So our first reading is from Genesis chapter 15. Here we see uh, Abram afraid. And he's afraid because he's, he's getting to be an old man and he hasn't had a son yet. He hasn't had a child who can carry on his family name. Um, in addition to that, he hasn't had a son. Uh, and God has promised that his son and his family would be the family that the Savior would come from. And we see how the Lord quieted those fears, calmed those worries with his promises to Abram. Not only to give him that little thing of having a son and having his family go on, but the, the big promises about his plan to save uh, Abram and all people through his family. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir. But a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is God's word.
second reading comes from the, the end of the Bible, uh, one of the last books, Hebrews. And here the author, in chapter 11, talks about faith. And he uses Abram as an example of great faith. Um, shows us that uh, faith holds on to what we can't see. So we look around us and everything that we see seems to indicate that we should be afraid, that we should worry. But faith holds on to God's promises. So we don't have blind faith. It's not that we don't just believe for no reason. We believe because God has promised many things to us through his word. So see that in Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children, because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is God's word. gospel reading is from Luke chapter 12. These will be the basis for this morning's message. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and your body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon and all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. 
Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the gospel of the Lord, and you can be seated. basis for this morning's message is that reading that you just heard from the Gospel of Luke. We'll hear those words again throughout today's sermon. Dear sheep of God's little flock, here's a trivia question for you this morning, maybe especially if you're a big fan of animated movies. What do the, the Lion King, the Jungle Book, and Oliver and Company, those movies, what do those have in common with Luke chapter 12? I'll give you a second to think. They all include animals who show us or tell us not to worry. So in, in The Lion King, you have uh, the meerkat uh, Timon and the warthog Pumbaa, and they sing Akuna Matata. It means no worries for the rest of your days. In the Jungle Book, you have a bear named Baloo who sings the bear necessities, and he says, forget about your worries in your life. In the Oliver and Company, you have a dog named Dodger who sings a song called, Why Should I Worry? And of course, in, in Luke chapter 12, you have a raven who shows you not to worry, too. Why are all these animals telling us not to worry? Well, do you ever see animals worrying about things? Do you ever see a bear worrying about retirement when some bears hibernate up to eight months of the year? Do you ever see a raven that's worried about where its next meal is going to come from as they're picking whatever happens to be out in the road? But we worry, don't we? We worry about our health, we worry about our, uh, what we're eating, about our exercise, we worry at work, we worry at home, we worry on vacation, we worry about our lives, we worry about our, our parents' lives, our siblings' lives, our kids' lives, our spouses' lives, our friends' lives. We worry. Wouldn't you like to stop, just stop worrying? Well, I can't promise you that by the end of this sermon or by the end of this hour that all of your worries are going to be gone, but I can tell you what God promises you today, which is that you, even if you do worry, you do not need to worry. You do not need to worry. Because God's promises are bigger than your biggest fears. That's what our reading from Luke chapter 12 is going to teach us today. So this reading, it comes right after the reading from last week. 
So last week we heard about a man who came to Jesus and he told him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And so Jesus responds by telling this parable of the rich fool, which he sums up by saying, This is what will happen for everyone who stores up for themselves and is not rich towards God. And it's nothing, nothing good. And then he talks about worrying. So if you, you could say that maybe last week was more directed at that, that man's brother who was holding on to his inheritance. Last week was about greed. And this week is more directed towards that man himself who is so worried about losing out. Who is so worried. We're going to get more into that reading in a second. But maybe for a second we should just think about what is worry exactly? So somebody, a, a couple of months ago in Bible study, somebody asked that question. What's the difference between, say, worry and concern? So maybe we think about that for a minute. Worry and concern, they're, they're on the same spectrum. You could say they're on the same spectrum of, of caring, right? And on the flip side is not caring at all. It's indifference. So think about it, like, for your job. It would not be a good thing if you didn't care at all about your job. If you showed up late every day for work, if you spent your hours scrolling on your phone instead of working, that would not be good, right? But on the flip side, it wouldn't be good if you worried so much about your job that you couldn't stop thinking about it, that you couldn't stop working, that you prioritized it over every other thing that you have going on in your life. That wouldn't be good either. So worrying is it's, it's caring too much, right? And concern, a healthy concern, looks like caring about your job, but just seeing it as one among many other things that God has given you to do with your life. Worry is when you care too much. And we worry. We care too much. Why is that? Well, when you get to the heart of it, it's all about our, our sinful nature. So you and I have a sinful nature that thinks too highly of, our, of us. I think too highly of myself. I think too little of God. And of course, you and I also have a new self. We have, by faith, a new self, and that's who you really are. And your new self believes God's promises, trusts God. But so there's this battle going on in your heart every day between trusting and worrying between faith and being afraid. It is a battle that you by yourself don't have the strength to fight. It's a battle that leads you, leads each of us to repent every day. That's why at church we start with repenting. It means admitting our sins, bringing them to Jesus, receiving his forgiveness, receiving his strength to go out and, and live another day of faith. Well, Jesus today he points out two flaws in our sinful nature's arguments for worrying. Two ways in which our sinful nature thinks too little of God and too much of ourselves. So we'll see those as we listen again to Jesus' words. So listen again to the first couple of verses of our reading. And Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? So the first flaw in our sinful nature's reasoning is that when we worry, we think we overestimate our own control. A heart that worries reflects a head that thinks, I am in control. I, if I just get everything right, then I can make a good life for myself and nothing bad will ever happen to me and nothing bad will have ever happen to, every, to the people that I, I love. But of course, we, we know by experience that this isn't true. This isn't how it works. We know by experience how little there is that we can actually control 
in our lives. You can't control the people around you, can you? You can try. You can't control what happens at your job, what happens at school. You can't control the weather. You can't control the stock market. You can't even oftentimes control yourself, can you? You can't control as much as your sinful nature would lead you to believe. This shows even in worrying itself. So if you look up the effects of worrying, it's ironic. I looked it up this week. There's an article from WebMD that said this. Chronic worrying can affect your daily life so much that it may interfere with your appetite, lifestyle habits, relationships, sleep, and job performance. Many people who worry excessively are so anxiety-ridden that they seek relief in harmful lifestyle habits such as overeating, cigarette smoking, or using alcohol and drugs. So think about it this way. You, you worry about not getting enough sleep. Well, what happens next? You can't sleep. You worry about your health, and it makes you less healthy. We can't even, by worrying, as Jesus says, can you add a single hour to your life? No, obviously you can't. We overestimate our own control of our lives. We also, on the flip side, we, we underestimate God's control. God says, I, the creator of everything, I am in control of your life, and I care about you. And our sinful nature says, no, I don't believe you. Our sinful nature says, no, I am the only one who cares. I'm in this alone. It's all up to me. Our sinful nature, by worrying, says, I don't trust you, God. So what's the solution? How do we fix this? Well, sometimes it seems like we, we think the way that we fix worrying is by worrying about worrying. If we just try really hard not to worry, then we can stop. But of course, that doesn't work to either, right? When you think about it, that's just another way that we try to control things that we really can't control. What's the way that you get a stronger faith? Is it by thinking really hard about believing? No, the Bible says faith comes from hearing the message, the message about Christ. So what is the cure for worrying? It's to repent each and every day and to go back to Jesus and to receive his forgiveness. If you don't worry, then you don't need forgiveness. But if, if you do, then you have a reason to go back to him. If you sin every day, you, you have a reason to have a savior. And so you go to him, he forgives you, he gives you the strength to not worry today, the strength to believe. So that's flaw number one. We overestimate our own control. We underestimate God's control. Now let's listen to the second flaw in our sinful nature's argument for worry. So Jesus goes on. Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. So this is the second flaw. This is the second thing that our sinful nature does. We overvalue the stuff that we have, our possessions. We overvalue the people that God puts in our lives. All good things. But we convince ourselves that these are the things that we need to be happy, the things that we need to be safe, well, all the while knowing that all of these things are temporary. 
All of these people are temporary. We overvalue the stuff that God gives us, and we undervalue his kingdom. God says to you, in Jesus, I'm with you. I, the creator of the universe, the one that made every last thing that exists, the one that continues to keep creation going, I am with you. And you can call me your heavenly father. In Jesus, I'm going to be with you every day of your whole life. And I'm going to be there to forgive your sins. I'm going to be there to to strengthen you, to keep going, to keep believing. And when you get to the end of your life, I'm going to be there too. And I have a place reserved for you in heaven where you're never going to go hungry again. You're going to have all the food and all the drink that you ever need. Where you'll have a closet that is just filled with clothes. You'll never have to worry about that again. Where there's a medicine cabinet that's empty. No more medicine, no more aches and pains. Where there'll be no alcohol abuse, there'll be no drugs. Because everyone will be perfectly safe, perfectly happy, perfectly healed. There'll be never any reason to worry again. And that's what I give to you. But we undervalue that again. Our sinful nature. It can't see it, so it can't struggles to believe it. Our sinful nature says to these promises from God, no, it's not true, I don't believe it. And our sinful nature says, in what world would a guy like God just freely offer me everything that I could ever want or need? In what world would that happen? In what world could I ever deserve that? And our sinful nature wants to work for good things, work for safety, work for happiness. But God says that's not the way it works. And so Jesus goes on to explain exactly why God would do this for you and me. He says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Why does God offer you? Why does your Father offer you his kingdom? Because he's happy to do it. It's not that you're so smart. You and I are not that smart. It's not that you and I are so hardworking. You and I are not that hardworking. It's not that you and I will never mess things up. We'll always get things right. We know by experience that's not true. It's simply that God is pleased to promise these things to you. It's simply because of who God is. And because God is faithful, that's why you can believe these promises and not fear. God cares for you. If somebody spends their time with you, you know that they care, right? They give up their time to to be with you. If somebody were to give you their car for some reason, if you needed a car, they said, take my car, you would know that they care about you. If somebody gave you their house and said, take it when you needed it, you would know that they care for you. So if God would give you his son, the one who calm the storm, the one who conquered death, if God would give you his son to forgive all your sins, how much must he care for you? And the God who cares for you is in perfect control, not just of the big things, not just of the course of history, of the the little things that happen every day too, right? Jesus says, consider the ravens. Jesus says, consider the, the wildflowers. God is big enough to control those two, the big things and the little things. And so God's advice to you today is not to worry because of his promises to you. When you find yourself afraid, go back to him, repent, and he'll give you that same forgiveness. 
And he'll give you that same peace. He'll make those same promises to you again and again. Go back to the, the people who have believed and lived before. Go back to Abraham. Abraham, in the middle of everything, he was just as afraid as, just as, afraid as, you, as you and I are. But look what God did for him. He gave him everything that he promised he would. The Bible says it this way in another passage. It says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So let's go back to, to animals for a second. I, don't, I know many of you probably own dogs. And I don't know if this is true because I've never owned a dog myself. But when I think of when a dog might be worrying the most, I'm guessing it's probably when a dog's owners aren't there, aren't there with him. And whether or not that's true, it's something similar that's true for you and me. The only time that you and I need to worry is if our Heavenly Father is not here with us. And our Heavenly Father is always with us, which means that you never need to worry. God's promises are bigger than your biggest fears. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now we'll, we'll revisit those promises again by speaking the first article of the Apostles' Creed, um, also speaking Martin Luther's explanation to that article. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God created me and all that exists and that he gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my mind and all my abilities. I richly and daily providing clothing and shoes, food and drink, property and home. All I need to keep my body and life. Protecting me from all evil. All this God does only because He is my good and merciful Father in heaven, and not because I deserve or deserve it. This I ought to thank and praise, to serve and obey. This is most certainly true. You can be seated. Now we'll continue with the offering. During that time, if you could, take a moment to sign the connection card and drop that off in the offering plate as it's passed. stand for prayer. Today we include a couple of additional prayers 
um, a couple of people who have been called home to their Heavenly Father. One is uh, Julie Christensen, is the sister of or, uh, Jane Newman. Uh, she was called to her Heavenly Home after a battle with cancer. Um, and that was a couple of weeks ago. And also Guy Kluge was called to his Heavenly Home this past week. Uh, so we keep uh, Julie's family and uh, also Guy's family in our prayers today. O oh God, our faithful Lord, generation after generation, you have proven yourself both good and trustworthy. You make promises to your people and you keep them again and again. On the other hand, guard us from being careless or wasteful with what you give us. Instead, give us hearts that are content with what you give and hands that use the strength you give us to work faithfully to provide for ourselves and our families. If there are times when we have more than we need, Give us eyes to see the people in our lives who need help and generous hearts like yours. Forgiveness of sins. True hope and a home in heaven to always look forward to. Give us your spirit to seek first these blessings. And Heavenly Father, comfort today the families of Julie and Guy, whom you've now called home to eternal glory in heaven. We praise you for making them both your children in baptism and keeping their faith through the good news about Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for the blessings that you brought to your church, to their communities, and to their families, through their lives of Christian service. May the peace and the promise of your son's sacrifice on the cross and his empty tomb bring comfort to the hearts of all who mourn. Help us always to live in joyful anticipation of the day when you will call us from our graves, reunite us with Julie and Guy and all believers, and fill us with perfect bliss in your presence forever. And we join to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You can be seated. Now God comes to us through his supper. The Lord be with you. Also you. Lift up your hearts. Lift Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's good to thank you all the time, Lord. You promise that wherever we gather in your name, you are with us.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. These words mean that you have peace forever with God. Believe it.
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, now we go with God's blessing. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil, and may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. once again and welcome to worship uh, just a couple of announcements today uh, first of all we have a take home bible study again today it's in Zechariah, so you can find that on the tall round table out in the hallway kind of by the coat rack uh, so uh, two more weeks of that next week is going to be malachi which is the last week of or last book of the old testament um, then uh, just something to note that last week was the the last week of the summer that we'll have the Wednesday night Bible study, so that we'll take a break from that for now, and then we'll have uh, more Bible studies coming up in the fall, starting in the fall. Um, then looking forward to the next couple weeks, uh, 
we'll be taking some photos next week. So after the 10 o'clock service, we're going to ask anybody who's willing to stick around uh, to do that, and we'll take some photos that we can use, kind of reenact different parts of the worship, and take some photos that we can use for uh, our website, uh, for publication, and stuff like that. Um, so if you can, can stick around, please do for that. Uh, then looking forward to the, the 21st, we have our church picnic coming up. Uh, that week we'll also have uh, the, opening, uh, the opening service for our school. Uh, so that'll be an exciting week coming up in two weeks uh, for another school year. Uh, the church picnic will be, we'll have church in here and then afterwards we'll, we'll go outside and we'll have a meal and different games and activities there. So it'll be a good event for the whole family. Um, and two last things. Uh, we had a Utah, Utah trip presentation this past week. Um, if anyone is interested in doing that next year, you can talk to me, um, or you can sign up on, there's a sheet on the other round table in the hallway by the doors of the fellowship hall. You can sign up if you want to be on the email list for that. And finally, uh, the youth group bonfire is coming up this week. So that's on Wednesday night at starting at 730 so hopefully it'll be a little bit dark by then. Um, it'll be over at the Parsonage. That's 213 North Nash Street next to the old church building. And those are all the announcements. You can find the rest in the printed news and notes. God's blessings on the rest of your week. Oh, come on.